Is someone, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming for the uh, ICNs. Right now, this is room one for the first sessions that we are going to run for the concurrent sessions. The topic will be on quality improvements. Time is running short. I don't want to stop you from the lunch hours. So please be seated. And I'm glad our first presenter is, uh, is here already. So please be seated. And uh, for other report, uh, for other presenter, please come up to me, and I'll be around near the stage or the gentleman next to me, and uh, report uh, uh, yourself. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I'm ready? ready? Yep. Okay, yeah. okay. All right, time for our first presenters, and then uh, her name is Maxi Maria. I, I'm very uh, like her. The reason is that she's also from uh, emergency nursing. And then uh, she's right now a nurse practitioner uh, uh, from uh, uh, U.S. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Matty, please. Oh, thank, you. Thank, thank you. you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Mary Shucker. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner in the emergency department at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia uh, in the United States. I have been a past uh, professor and instructor at the University of Pennsylvania, a cute chronic program. And what I brought, why I traveled here besides to stay at the Marina Bay Sands and visit everything in Singapore, is that I wanted to share with you um, our progress and results um, in a quality improvement project on improving um, the characteristics of nurse practitioner to nurse practitioner handoff. You probably wonder, why is this important to me? I'm a nurse. Um, really, what's more important, what I want you to take away from this presentation, is that within your institution, you need to own and identify things that you are in control of. Over at Children's Hospital, we have an overnight unit. Um, and that is run by the nurse practitioners of the emergency department. Um, there had been an institutional um, practice to improve communication at handoff, and several of our nurse practitioners were involved in a, a collaborative multidisciplinary team. Um, however, in the unit that I'm going to talk about, it's only nurse practitioner to nurse practitioner. There's very little um, information or research on the characteristics of uh, handoff between nurse practitioners. So, what I'm going to share with you, and if you look at the slides, there's going to be more slides than we'll get to today. And if anybody has any questions 
about kind of the process or something you want to think might be something for quality improvement area in your institution, please feel free to email me, grab my card or whatever. So little background um, in our organization is um, our EDECU unit for many years, overnight unit was 10 beds. In the United States and probably in other areas um, throughout the world, we've seen an increase in behavioral health patients. Um, and we needed a, a, to increase our capacity to um, manage those patients while they're awaiting inpatient placement um, settings. Our uh, unit increased from 10 beds to 14 beds with no increases in staff or nurse practitioners to help manage the patients. So we looked at our rounding process and our goal was to standardize it um, to improve like patient family relations, safety and characteristics of handoff. Um, the first one we looked at was the 3 p.m. rounding. Um, initially we have, um, so this is our rounding survey and over the period of a couple months during several different intervals, we had an observer um, look at where the nurse practitioners were rounding, as well as have them do a follow-up survey. Um, out of the survey, we had 139 surveys over the course of the next several months. Um, and what we came to realize was that our nurse practitioners among themselves were frustrated that there was not a standard between them, um, and also that you know, some people, everybody had a different style. Um, this is, now don't be scared by this slide, but this was just when our, we have a very robust program of um, quality improvement in our institution. And this is one of the first uh, things you have to do, is you have to look at your, what you want your outcomes to be and what your drivers were. So this is just to give you an idea of that. Certainly in 10 minutes, I can't go through everything with you. Um, what we found post-survey, post-teaching, um, daily reminders, um, and interaction with our other NPs was that we found that um, our goal was to have the rounds happen at the nurse's station in the unit. Um, and we found that post-interaction, I mean post-interventions, uh, um, that our rounds did increase from probably less than 50% to 90%. Additionally, currently, we have tied um, this metric to our overall uh, bonus incentive program with a goal of 70%. Our fiscal year ends July, actually ends in a couple days, and we are now at 75%. So over the course of the last year, we've been able to make that improvement. Um, the other thing which is really important throughout our hospital, but also that we wanted to incorporate, was um, it's very important for the in and outgoing team, family nurses, to make introductions to say, you know, I'm taking over for this nurse practitioner here. This is, you know, why you're here. This is what the plan of care is. And then we also have something called whiteboards or chalkboards or information boards or whatever you want to call them. And we update those. So that was also another key metric. Um, and then our next step, which we're currently working on now, but we have several more barriers. Um, is our 7 a.m. round, so maybe I'll get to come back next year or in Abu Dhabi and tell you about where the progress we made on that, too. Um, but I will leave my card and some pens up front. Please take and email me if you have any questions or, you know, want to bounce around some ideas or have other questions about quality improvement. I think that's my 10. Am I good? I just didn't want to go over, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mary, for her details, uh, introductions, and uh, telling us uh, what emergency departments are. Any questions from the floor right now? Oh, yes. yes, of course. Oh. Any questions so far? All right, uh, there's something that left behind by uh, Mary later on, so uh, people can uh, have it uh, after the sessions then, okay? And then let's start with our next speaker, Matty Maria. Huh? And she is the senior manager of Denmark University Hospitals. And then her topic will be on tailored implementation of e-health services, the latest technology to improve the treatment of mental disorder. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mette Maria Skut and I'm from Denmark, from the northern part of Europe. Very happy to be here today. Um, I'm uh, responsible for our international activities at a hospital in Denmark, a university hospital in Denmark. And uh, one of the special things about the hospitals in Denmark is that we have a very short length of stay in hospital. And our average length of stay is 3.2 days at the moment. And our setting is that we, in 2022, will have a brand new hospital. We're building it right now. And the challenge there is that we will have 20% fewer beds, a lower budget, and a lot more patients to come. And I think that's probably the same across the world, that there's the challenges that we are facing. What we also know is that the patients of the future, they want to be involved, they, they are demanding, and they want self-treatment, they want to be part of their own treatment and to lead it, actually. And this is the challenges that we need to meet. So, for us, the challenge is that we have a hospital where we actually need to keep the patients out of the hospital and still provide high-quality care at the same time. Um, so one of our strategies is that we need to think in new ways to do this, and uh, IT technology is one of the answers. We hope at least, <laughs> nobody really knows, but that is what we are trying to do. And uh, this is one of those projects I have brought here today to speak a bit about. Implemental, it's a big European project, um, 11 countries and a budget of seven million. Uh, euros and uh, the target area is treatment of mental diseases using uh, e-health technologies. Uh, depression is one of the cases that we use uh, in this uh, big project and what we know is it's a disease that uh, include a lot of patients around the world, millions and millions of uh, patients suffer from depression across the world and uh, with a severe negative impact for the well-being and the quality of life. What we also know is that even though depression has been a disease that's been here for years and years, there's still huge challenges in that area. Uh, it's underdiagnosed, uh, the waiting lists are very long still, and the, the pharmaceutical treatment has uh, side effects, sometimes severe side effects. What we also know is that there are some possibilities in the area of IT, if you use them right. Um, there's a cognitive behavioral therapy where you use a computer program and you can treat the patients at home with contact to professionals. You can also use video conferences, either for the treatment directly to the patients or for specialists to uh, reach out to nurses, generalists, practitioners, yes. But we also know that the challenge is that a lot of money is being put into new e-health technologies, uh, but we only see a few of them after a couple of years. Uh, they, they seem to disappear. Uh, very few of them makes it from the project to actually daily care. Uh, so, so something loses in the connection between research and daily operation in this area, and we spend a lot of money in that area. Uh, both locally, but also nationally and internationally. So the vision of this project is to, to close the gap between the research project and the routine care and try to connect those two things. Uh, in this project, we like to develop an intervention, an it fits tool kill kit to uh, facilitate tailored implementation. So this is all about implementations and tools of how to implement IT into daily operation. We also want to study the impact and, of course, disseminate it. So the first step is to develop a toolkit. It's been done by a research group in England uh, based on uh, evidence and also, um, uh, what's it called, interviews. And uh, this is the toolkit, and unfortunately, unfortunately, I cannot show you the steps right now because it's confidential due to a randomized controlled trial, but hopefully I can be back in Abu Dhabi and show you a little more about the details. 
Um, the second part is a research study where we are testing the effect of it, what works and what doesn't work, and that is ongoing right now. Uh, we have 12 sites, and we have a step rich trial where all, all the sites will have the intervention at a certain time, and every three months we measure um, the outcomes. And part three will be dissemination. This is uh, developed in the area of e-mental health, but it can be um, disseminated into the more somatic areas as well. And what we see already now is that in Albania, we went from zero ICBT solutions to, to uh, 60. So, so there's definitely possibilities here. We just need to know the right way of doing it. Yeah, so the big question is, do we really need nurses in these big implementation projects? They're run by project managers across the world. But, and yes, nurses have the highest degree of direct contact with the patients right now. They have the clinical expertise to be crit uh, critical about these interventions coming from sometimes private companies. Uh, they know the need of the patients. They can support both patients and uh, relatives. They know how to teamwork, very good at that. Uh, and uh, of course, they are the voice of the patients. So yes, the answer is nurses are essential for implementation. So that is really the, the big key message to when directors, medical doctors, researchers have projects that they want to implement, well, please include the nurses in the very beginning of the project if you want a success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Any questions from the floor? Oh, great. How many participants and what are your outcome measures? Okay, um, it's actually organizations that we include, and uh, that is um, in, across Europe that we have 16 different, we have 12 sites where we uh, measure on organization and the readiness of including uh, new technologies, and then we measure on the, um, on the staff as well, so it's a step away from the patients. Uh, so it's really about the technology and how they implement it into daily operation and how they normalize again. So it's a theory about normalization that is the whole way behind. Thank you so much, Matty. Yes, as time is running short, let's, let's welcome our third speakers. Maria Larsson, professor in nursing, Costa University from Sweden. Thank you. Dear Chairman and dear colleagues, I will present the study Adaptation of the Quality from Patient Perspective Instrument for Use in Nurse-Led Cancer Care and Patients' Perceptions of Care Received by Contact Nurses in Swedish Cancer Care. And my co-workers are Professor Bodil Wille Larsson and PhD Kajsa Bjurosete. We work at Kasa University in Sweden, which is located up north in Europe. We face a major challenge globally with an increasing number of people being diagnosed, living with, and surviving cancer. And this is taking place in an era when cancer care to a large extent is fragmentized, lacks continuity, and patients repeatedly report unmet physical, psychosocial, and emotional needs and uncertainty. The evidence based of the value and effectiveness of nurse-led cancer care to meet cancer patients long-term complex needs and improved patient outcome is growing, and various models of nurse-led services have been established in recent decades. And in Sweden, should all patients be assigned to a contact nurse with the goal to improve patient participation, continuity, and care quality? Evaluation of care qualities at these services from the patient's perspectives it's important to guide improvements and further implementation. 
However, there is a lack of instruments explicitly founded on a theoretical model of care quality from the patient's perspectives. And this is important to ensure the measurement of all aspects of care essential to the patients. The instrument quality from the patient's perspective, QPP, is based on a theoretical model of care quality developed by Wilde and colleagues. The model is based on the care quality being performed through patients' preferences, norms, expectations, and experiences, and on the encounter with the care structure. From this, care quality can be seen as patients' perception of the actual care received and perceptions of how important various care aspects are to them. Therefore, each item is measured in two ways, as perceived reality and subje subjective importance. And although QPP is based on a theoretical model of care quality, it has not undergone psychometric evaluation in nurse-led cancer care contexts. So, the aim of this study was to adapt the QPP for use in nurse-led cancer care contexts and to describe patients' perceptions of care, quality care provided in terms of the subjective importance of the care aspects and the perceptions of the care received by contact nurses in Swedish cancer care. The adaptation of the QPP instrument for nurse-led cancer care was performed in four steps. Modifications and constructions of new items were mainly based on a review of the literature and qualitative patient interviews. In addition, clinical experience was used. Face and content validity were assessed by 10 experienced cancer nurses. And this resulted in a 39-item version to be psychometric evaluated. Patients from 28 different contact nurse services with cancer of the prostate, breast, colon, and rectum, and head and neck were included in a cross-sectional study. Data were collected four months after start of treatment using this 39-item version. An explorative factor analysis using principal component analysis was performed for psychometric evaluation and internal consistency was assessed by Cronbach Alpha. Paired T-tests were used to describe patients' perceptions of their care. An exploratory factor analysis could be performed on 53 patients and resulted in a stable three-factor solution explaining almost 83% of the total variance and factors showed high internal consistency. QPP instrument adapted for nurse-led cancer care now consists of 27 items. Three factors, information regarding health and care trajectory, compassionate and competent contact nurses, and patient participations and individualized care, together with 12 single items. And some areas for improvement were found when comparing patient scores for the subjective importance and perceived reality scales. Subjective importance were statistically significant higher for the factor information regarding health and care trajectory, as for items related to information regarding symptoms and side effects, self-care, planning and coordination of care, and availability of the contact nurse. No differences were found for the factors compassionate and competent contact nurse and patient participation and individualized care. So, to conclude, the QPP and LCC shows promising results but needs to be further validated and tested in a larger group of patients. A review and development of contact nurse services are warranted in order to provide effective, safe, and comprehensive care to meet the complex needs of persons living with and beyond cancer. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maria, for your introductions and uh, about the contact nurses. Any questions from the floor? Any questions from the floor? 
No. Oh, Crystal oh, clear. And, okay. okay. Thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. Um, is your tool uh, is your tool available if others want to um, test and validate it in different settings outside of Sweden? Yes, I think it is. Okay. Thank yes. you. Any more questions? If no, maybe one question from Eden. I would like to know whether the patients are happy with the contact nurses. Um, some, because um, in another study uh, we have shown that there are different models. Um, to have a contact nurse is good if she is available, if she is competent, and so on. Okay, thank you so much, Maria. Okay, and uh, thank you so much. And uh, let's, uh, time is running short. And please be informed that that uh, filming here is totally forbidden. Please do not take any filming here. Okay. And I will now come to our fourth speaker, Jane Desperoth from Australia. Oh, thank you. And then her topic will be on the practical use of the patient and environment and the satisfaction model in the nurse led outpatient cardiac clinics. Thank you, Jane. Oh. Oh. Sorry, okay. Hello, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay. The rapid increase in the prevalence of chronic diseases has increased the focus of health services on activities aimed at disease prevention and self-management. Two key measures of the quality of care received by patients are patient satisfaction and enablement. Patient satisfaction is described between, as the difference between the care that patients receive and their expectations of good health care, including their reactions to the structure, process and outcomes of care. Patient enablement is defined as patients' abilities to manage their health and life, and interventions aimed at recognising patients' capacity for self-management and promoting their means of doing this are essential for enablement. An existing conceptual framework... Oh, gee whiz. OK, sorry, there's something gone wrong with my presentation. Uh, an existing... No, conceptual framework. Can someone help me with this? Um, I'm sorry about this. Okay. It's just slipping to the final slides rather than uh, going on to the one I, I need to look at next. Uh, so the next one should be... No. Okay. It's not working. Sorry. Uh, see here. Well, the third slide is going straight to the findings. The, uh, the third slide should look like this, and it's going straight to the findings. OK, just go next. No, OK, it's not working. So can we... I'm sorry about this. I can't actually... I need a picture of the model. So it's going straight to the slideshow. It's actually not showing the correct slides. Uh, quality improvement is very important lately regarding on a lot of uh, area with the uh, accreditations from various uh, hospital, hospital accreditation bodies. I don't want to name the names. And uh, that's why did we have a concurrent session on it here. All right, please. Thank you. Hello? Okay. I'm, I'm going to have to give the presentation without all of the slides. Fortunately, I have a copy of the slide showing the model and I have a copy of the education resource and the papers associated with this project available on the table down here. Um, an existing conceptual framework, the Patient Enablement and Satisfaction Model, which I'll refer to as the PESM, and it looks like this. I have laminated copies of this available for you on this table here. I'll hold it up. Can you see that? <laughs> Um, it is sentinel in theorising the mechanisms through which nurses may impact 
upon patients' experience of both satisfaction and enablement. While enablement is key to self-management, our research supports results from previous studies that indicate a close relationship between enablement and satisfaction. In this model, satisfaction is considered a prerequisite for enablement. The model describes nurse, patient and general practice characteristics that underpin actions and interactions that support stage one, triggering healthcare partnerships between patients and nurses, and stage two, tailoring care to meet each patient's unique needs. As a result of this process, enablement manifests as one, patients' health-seeking behaviours and choices are based on their understanding of their unique healthcare needs. Two, patients gain the confidence to take a lead in their partnership with nurses and seek choices in their care. And three, patients obtain healthcare that meets their personal needs, preferences and goals. While the PESM has been validated in primary care, we believed this model would be a practical and useful tool in a variety of clinical settings. Our aim was to evaluate the applicability and practical use of the PESM in an ambulatory chronic care setting. Using theories of experience learning, self-determination and problem-based learning to inform our approach, uh, our first step was to develop an education resource to facilitate translation of the PESM. I have copy, copies of this resource available on the table. Um, the resource included a background describing why quality of care is important for chronic disease management, definitions, learning objectives, a picture of the model and an illustrative case study. The study took place in four nurse-led cardiology outpatient clinics in a tertiary hospital in Australia. The clinics are attended by approximately 4,500 patients per year, and the nurses working in the clinics come from a variety of backgrounds, with some trained and experienced in chronic disease management, whilst others had trans transitioned from working in the acute, acute hospital setting to the outpatients' clinics. A four-criterion framework identified by Corbin and Strauss was established to, to used to establish the model's um, value and informed development of the interview protocol. The model must fit the substantive area in which it will be used, be readily understandable, be applicable in diverse and multiple situations in the substantive area, and give the user partial control over the structure and process of situations as they change over time. Three information sessions were co conducted in July 2017 which included the provision of a training resource, and the session included a presentation describing the PESM, its origins and application to a case study. Participants were then given an opportunity to discuss the model uh, in terms of their clinics and the elements of their practice that were congruent or differed from the approach recommended. Uh, we analysed, uh, we used framework analysis for its suitability for research that has a particular questions related to predefined issues and a predefined sample. Now, the, the slides are working with the findings, I believe. Okay. Um, so the findings, how, how does the model fit within the clinic? Okay. Participants stated that the PESM validated the importance of nurses' role in optimising patients' capacity to manage their health. I think all nurses need to be reminded about enablement. Uh, we now have a lot of patients who are institutionalised and rely on health professionals to lead their every move without taking ownership of their health. Um, it stimulated discussion about scope of practice, identifying differences in education between those with chronic disease management training and those without. Those new to CDM found it extremely informative, some identifying gaps in their practice and sought out more information about chronic disease management from their colleagues. All participants reported that the education session encouraged reflection on their practice and that they were reminded of the importance of continuity of care and relationship building. I know patients identify with one particular nurse and often if they ring up and ask for that nurse, I think that's maybe what we could aim for, that a particular nurse has particular patients. All participants found the model clear and readily understandable. Many felt the case study optimised their understanding and particularly the idea of scaffolding 
as it situated the model in a real life example that they were able to relate to and draw parallels in their own practice and experience. They indicated the education resource was useful for both existing and new staff. Yes, great for all nurses as a new concept or an ongoing reminder of best practice. The model was viewed as realistic and flexible rather than being prescriptive. Participants felt it offered a way to empower patients to make health-related decisions. Yes, because everyone's individual, everyone goes a different, down, down a different pathway. So you can't have a set model that everyone's got to fit into. The model was seen to align with chronic disease self-management aims of the clinics and allow care to be individualised to patients' needs. One nurse stated that it seems more usable than other models as it is more cons consultation based and allows for more opportunistic care without the need to answer questionnaires and follow predetermined protocols. Participants were enthusiastic about the flexibility of the model and how it facilitated the changing needs of patients to provide more or less support as needed. Uh, from my experience, they move between being enabled and not being enabled. I think all nurses can resonate with that. Regular contact is needed with patients and reassurance that they're still being enabled. Uh, after the information session, one participant was motivated to improve a current communication process. When we refer someone to a diabetic educator or dietitian or physiotherapist, there has to be a way, make a flow chart to make sure that either ourselves or well, the next person says to Joe Bloggs, have you been contacted by that person yet? The pes our findings demonstrate that the PESM is practical and usable in nurse-led clinics. The education resource was important for the model's opera operationalisation into clinical practice and the use of a visual model and an illustrative case study was very effective. The flexibility and control of the PESM provides a criteria essential for the management of chronic illnesses. This is reflected in the trajectory framework for chronic disease, which acknowledges that chronic diseases vary and change over time, and the way that they are managed can shape the physical and biographical consequences of the illness. The PESM and accompanying education resource provides a concrete knowledge translation tool to support evidence-based chronic disease management in nurse-led outpatient cardiology clinics. Thank you for your patience with my lack of slides and I really encourage you to um, take a copy of the model of the education resource and the papers that I have available down on the table. Hey, and uh, sorry for your first part of presentations. Okay, back to the floor now then. Anybody have any questions regarding the PIMS? Okay, thank you. Will the uh, model and the resources be translated into other lang languages, given that Australia is becoming more multicultural? Mm. Um, look, that's a really good point. We're, we're currently implementing it into the ACT renal service, but we are particularly uh, cognizant of the fact that we also have a very large refugee population, uh, particularly in the ACT, and that might be our next starting point to start translating it into some of those languages. and. If anyone wants to put up their hand to translate it into another language, I'm happy. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Jean. And then uh, time's running short, so I, uh, people can still ask questions uh, when the speaker comes down on the, uh, Jean on the floor. Okay, uh, to our next session will be uh, another colleague from Australia, Deborah Critty. And she's a professor of prenatal mental health from Greek University, Brisbane, Australia. Thank you, Deborah. It's great to be back in Singapore, and thank you for your attendance at this session. Domestic violence affects one in three women around the world. The health impact of domestic and family violence is severe, affecting women's mental health, their sexual and reproductive health, and can result in injury and death. In Australia, where this particular study was conducted, one to two women die every week 
due to violence perpetrated by an intimate partner. Violence against women is a global problem and in Australia costs the healthcare system alone nearly $900 million a year. There has been some controversy about routine inquiry about domestic and family violence. As we know, violence can commence or escalate during pregnancy. And so it provides an opportune time for nurses and midwives to make an influence in women's lives. However, routine screening may be implemented without sufficient comprehensive staff training, system changes and referral processes. Some clinicians in our own research identified that they were very hesitant to ask about women's experience of violence. Women them themselves may be unwilling to disclose violence with outside of a trusting relationship. A, a comprehensive systematic review in Cochrane recently identified that women uh, find screening very acceptable, but they are least comfortable discussing their fear of a partner or seeking help in this regard. Uh, while rates of disclosure do increase following routine screening, the, the possibility of a woman actually accepting referral tends to be very low. The World Health Organization recommends a case-based inquiry model, and so this research endeavoured to find out what did women think. We also found in our search that there were very few validated tools that seek women's opinion of routine screening. So we wanted to conduct a cross-sectional survey of women's perceptions of routine screening and undertake preliminary testing of three new tools. We used a simple one-site study. We recruited 204 women and uh, asked them about their personal characteristics, obstetric details. Did they recall being screened for violence during their pregnancy by a midwife? Did they experience any family history of violence and uh, to complete the three new scales? The scales looked at women's beliefs about screening, their reasons why they thought they or other women may not disclose violence, and their perceptions of the support provided by midwives. In this particular study, the vast majority of participants were Caucasian Australians. They were in a stable relationship, and over half the women were expecting their first baby. 95% of participants recalled being screened for violence. And of this sample, only 12 reported actually experiencing violence. And if you refer back to my very first slide, one in three women are actually experiencing violence. And so the routine screening did not increase disclosure of violence. Interestingly, nearly 25% of participants had witnessed or experienced violence in the home as a child, and that can be a risk factor. The new measures were found to be valid and reliable, and importantly, what we found is that women uh, were less likely to um, be in agreement with screening if they had experienced violence during childhood or if they were experiencing violence now. We also asked women to write some other comments of anything that might be uppermost in their minds. And the vast majority of the comments were positive. One woman said, the midwife made me feel comfortable and I agree with the care questions and the support offered in relation to domestic violence. However, some women did not find screening a positive experience. And 13 women reported negative experiences 
In Australia currently, and in the participating site, we usually ask partners to leave the consultation so these sensitive questions could be asked. And several women said that they were very affronted and insulted to have their partners asked to, be le to leave the consultation. We, this study found that generally women are supportive of routine inquiry and that concurs with the Cochrane Systematic Review. In the particular site where the study was conducted, high rates of screening had improved over time. So 12 months ago, 90% of women reported being screened and now it's up to 94%. However, rates of disclosure continue to be very low. Women did acknowledge the role of the nurse and the midwife in screening, but did not want their information shared with other healthcare providers and services. Therefore, it highlights the important role of nurse midwives to provide support, information, and focus on the woman's safety. We conclude that uh, uh, we're now going to trial more case-based risk assessment in line with the World Health Organization recommendations. Our, late, our low rates of disclosure have clearly demonstrated to us the need for a more targeted approach to screening. We are implementing integrated referral pathways at appropriate community-based community agencies where women can safely go to receive help and support. In a recent uh, study in Spain, they identified that two questions, or um, one question in fact, has very good correlation with the conflict tactic scale. And that's a simple question. Has your partner ever hit or hurt you in any way? And we're suggesting that that might be a useful routine screening question. Join with me in breaking the silence and encouraging women to talk about their experiences. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this study, Associate Professor Kathleen Baird and Kerry Gillespie. We received funding from the Hospital Foundation for this study, and I'm pleased to advise that the study was recently accepted in a, the journal Women and Birth. So if you're interested, you may read all of the details there. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, uh, for your introducing your studies. Seems very uh, successful, uh, especially on the old woman and the perinatal one. Any questions from the floor? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Judith Amicha from Kenya, and uh, I'm really touched. And thank you for the for the study. But I'm so touched about the the the, um, the fact that one in three women really uh, injured or die in, in a week. That's what you said. You can see this thing is on an increase. Even in Kenya, it is becoming higher. Yes. So, as what as what can we do as nurses to try and avert such like a thing? It because it's increasingly becoming too much and too much. And it's leading into mental health problems, whereby we get people getting committing suicide, and there is. These are some of the contributory factors. What can we do as nurses to avert these injuries? Uh, the area of domestic violence creates a great deal of discomfort and anxiety for nurses and midwives. However, the research indicates that one of the best things that you can do is to develop a trusting relationship with women and provide information about not only their personal rights not to be abused in any way, but how to protect themselves and their children. The research indicates that women may actually leave a relationship eight times before they finally leave the relationship. And when you speak with women, they don't often wish to leave the relationship at all. They simply want the violence to stop. And so having a nurse in whom they can trust, in whom they could 
re, uh, obtain confidential advice and information about community supports is a long way to go. And in fact, not encouraging women to leave the relationship unless it's safe to do so. Because as we know also from the research, is that at the time a woman leaves the relationship, the uh, violence can actually escalate even more. Thank you, Deborah, for the answer. And uh, I, feel, I saw a few hands over there, but I'm sorry that time is running short. And then uh, let's uh, go uh, for another speaker then. Okay, thank, thank you, Deborah. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, and then, thank you. Yeah. And now to uh, the next speaker from China, Hu Ting. Is Hu Ting there? Hu Ting Zai Ma. Hu Ting. Thank you. And then uh, right now, and then we go to the next one. There was Chi Wang from China as well. Chi Wang or Cha Wang from China. Okay. Uh, okay. Right now, then we can have a lot more time for discussion later on. But uh, right now, we uh, go to the our Last speaker, Lin. Lin is a professor in nursing from Bayer University, Texas, United States. Thank you, Lin. And her topic will be ensuring a nurse safety in the workplace and intervention to improve venue puncture skills in India. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to recognize my colleague, Dr. Shelby Garner, who um, is a co-researcher on this project and is here at, conference, at Congress uh, with us this week. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to share our work um, with our student that we did with our students, and that's a picture um, there on the screen of our team. So I want to point out this model uh, for upscaling global nursing partnerships is sort of the framework that we used um, to, uh, to develop and to continue our, our global partnerships that we uh, have uh, from Baylor University. And this particular study um, is going to be talking about, let me see if I can get my pointer here. Um, this, the, uh, the, the, the center um, circle there where you see research, mission and service, scholarship, and study abroad. Uh, this project that I'm going to be speaking about is part of mission and service that we um, do with our students um, on a yearly basis in several different places around the world, but my team um, goes to India, to Bangalore, India. So this is our, our sort of our conceptual framework that we use um, in talking about it. And our specific global partner, like I said, is Bangalore Baptist Hospital in Bangalore, India. Uh, we've had a long-term relationship with this partner, uh, probably about 10 years. Um, and we have developed this partnership over time, which we believe is an important foundational requisite for our work, that it's a long-term um, relationship uh, that we don't just go in for a short time and never come back. But we uh, have uh, commitments, um, reciprocity, long-term relationships, which then provides a rich learning experience for us and for our students, um, and uh, continuing that partnership uh, where our students, we go there, and then they bring uh, their group comes to us in the United States. So this project, this work, um, uh, came to being from an express need that um, our uh, global partner there in Bangalore um, spoke with us about. Uh, the summer before, our students had been to Bangalore Baptist Hospital and had done some observation on the nursing units. Uh, and this, our students came uh, away from those experiences uh, speaking about venipuncture and the venipuncture techniques and um, what they had seen with um, nurses having a hard time uh, being able to cannulate patients. Uh, so we began conversations with our nurses in the hospital there, conversations with the nurse faculty, as there is a school of nursing uh, associated with the hospital uh, that our students partner with, uh, and also with conversations with the nurse educator at the hospital about uh, 
bringing this project uh, to, to them next year. Uh, and so it was decided that, that we would, and so uh, thus became the background for this study. We know that venipuncture is the most common invasive procedure performed in the hospital by healthcare workers uh, globally. Um, and nurses are taught the principles in, in school um, and um, sometimes have the opportunity to practice in a simulation lab, but many times they're just taught the theoretical part of doing the skill and don't get to actually practice until they get to the hospital. Um, and so because of that, we have uh, people, uh, students who have knowledge, nurses who graduate with the knowledge of the skill, but no practi practical experience. And patients then feel very uncomfortable with uh, students or new graduates practicing, so to speak, uh, uh, with those skills on, on them. The WHO, the WHO in 2013, uh, produced guidelines for transforming and scaling up health professionals' education and training. And that document recommended continuing professional development for nurses. So again, this was part of our framework for choosing um, this, uh, this project uh, at Bangalore Baptist uh, as it, we knew that it would provide um, uh, training and education for the nurses at the hospital. Our purpose of the study then was to research the effectiveness of a peripheral IV access and care continuing education session among hospital nurses in India using low fidelity equipment. Our methods um, were the design was a quantitative pre-test, post-test design for knowledge improvement, a descriptive design uh, looking at skill accuracy, and continuing education intervention of low fidelity uh, simulation training. Our sample population was 180 staff nurses at, from Bangalore Baptist Hospital. Um, this was a 340 bed specialty tertiary private hospital in Bengaluru, India. The mean age of the nurse was 28.6 years, plus or minus six, uh, with a ex mean experience of 6.8 years. A variety of degrees were represented in our, in our nurses that we um, uh, worked with, uh, and a variety of departments were represented. We collected this data in July of 2017 through six two-hour sessions over two days' time. We had divided our students into groups, into small groups, uh, and gave a pretest then did a skills assessment, and then a post-test. We used the, a modified 10-item um, uh, exam from Lyon and Kasker's work on simulation um, IV and cannulation. Our participant knowledge um, is where we derive that information from. Our skills accuracy also used um, a modified, the modified lines and Kasker's skills checklist. We were deemed exempt by University IRB Board uh, from Baylor and approved by the Hospital IRB Ethics Committee in Bangalore. We did uh, receive informed and voluntary participation. Our data analysis was um, done through an IBM SPSS version 24. Uh, we looked at the, uh, using that we used the pair T test for knowledge improvement and a descriptive measures for our demographics and skill accuracy. Our results showed that our mean for our pretest results were 54.56 with a standard deviation of 14, compared to a mean for the post-test results of 73%. Um, and on first attempt, our uh, nurses were um, able to have 84% accuracy um, in their return demonstration of the skill. The second attempt the nurses took were 11.2% successfully completed the return demonstration of the IV and cannulation. 4.5 of the total group were not successful. So we did find a significantly statistical uh, improvement in knowledge at the point uh, uh, less than 0 0.001. Our findings were that the peripheral IV access and care continuing education was effective 
uh, in improving not nurses' knowledge, uh, again, at the P, uh, P level, zero, less than 001. And the majority of nurses, 95% indeed, demonstrated skill accuracy with peripheral IV insertion using the low fidelity IV simulation arms that we brought. Future research is needed to evaluate the transfer of this knowledge to the clinical setting. So this was a one-time um, uh, uh, intervention over a two-day period with these nurses. Uh, so follow-up performance improvement study would be needed to then see if this was clinically um, happening now at the bedside with these nurses. We know that this continuing nursing education, se these sessions were affordable using updated low fidelity simulation equipment uh, for repetitive practice. So it is something that could be uh, taken uh, globally um, using this, uh, this low fidelity equipment. It's portable. We were able to bring it with us in our suitcases. Um, and uh, we think that this is something that could be done in multiple sites. We know that it can improve care and knowledge and skill accuracy for nurses with limited hands-on experience. So, as we said, many of our nursing schools um, teach the theoretical component of this skill, but don't have, the students don't have much chance to practice uh, either in a simulation lab or in the hospital. Uh, so that this can be beneficial to the profession of nursing and to improving outcomes uh, for our patients. We know that education and practice of IV access is imperative to prevent the associated complications that come from um, uh, problems with uh, IV venipuncture, such as infection, uh, uh, distress from the pa of the patient who has to have multiple sticks, and long-term sequelae um, from nerve damage and that kind of thing. Continuing education for nurses does have potential um, significance to improve health and education in India and other low and middle income countries around the world. And this addresses many of the sustainable development goals that we heard about earlier today in our plenary session, uh, including those to promote health, education, and sustainable partnerships. So what's next for us um, with our team from Baylor? So we will return to Bangalore in uh, 2019 in July, next month. We'll be checking in with the hospital staff. Uh, we'll be having conversations with the nursing faculty uh, there at the School of Nursing. We'll have conversations with the nurse educator to see how things are going on the units with IV uh, cannulation. We'll also begin a needs assessment for breastfeeding initiatives. Uh, one of, we'll be taking uh, several graduate students along with our undergraduate nursing students. Uh, the graduate student will be doing her capstone DNP project and is, we are looking at um, something related to breastfeeding. My colleague, Dr. Garner, just received um, an award for, from the USAID Foundation to build a women and children's hospital uh, unit on this campus. And so one of the initiatives is from that project is to uh, increase breastfeeding initiatives. So we will be targeting that, um, that area. And then we'll, we've also been asked to uh, provide uh, education and life-saving skills with first aid at an elementary school that uh, the hospital has outreach um, connections with their community health project. This elementary school is near the hospital and so it provides community support uh, to this school. We wanna thank um, our Baylor Missions Fund um, for providing uh, the uh, partially funding this, this project. Uh, we know that we can't do this work alone and it takes many uh, parts from our university to send our teams out like this. So um, we, thank you, uh, we want to publicly thank uh, our university for being able to participate in this project. Uh, and we did publish this study in the Journal of Continuing Education and Nursing uh, with this citation if you would like to read the full study. But thank you for your attention today and uh, we want to know if you have any questions. Thank you so much for Lynn sharing with us the, uh, her Indian studies as far as Mary is over there. Okay, any questions from the floor? It remind me a lot of memories on uh, training with the IVs. Hey.
Thank you very much. It was a really brilliant uh, presentation and it's a really inspiring project. Um, I'm aware that Bangalore's um, probably in terms of uh, the social determinants of health in India quite uh, more comfortable than some areas, but of course within the city that is diverse. Do you have any plans for rolling this scheme out beyond Bangalore or to other parts of India? So that's a really great question. We have another team from our university uh, goes to Hyderabad, uh, which is just north uh, there uh, of Bangalore. They um, have a little different focus as they partner with the NICE Foundation, which is a, a neonatal intensive care um, a specific hospital. But they also do uh, rural work, um, mainly in maternal child um, areas. This could possibly be um, a project that they could take up, uh, but right now, um, our, because of our partnership that we focus on, our team with Bangalore, um, we're looking to see what, um, what other needs that they have. But I think that's a great idea. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. thank you. And uh, earlier, I saw many hands from the floor, and then uh, there's, uh, most speakers are still there with us. Any questions from the previous speakers, particularly for Deborah? I saw earlier, I saw a lot of hands over there with Deborah. Any hands right now? Okay, uh, now uh, is Wu Ting still there from China? Wu Ting. Oh, sorry about that. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. I'm Thomas from Ghana. I'm talking about Deborah's presentation, the one on violence. I realized that you spoke more about engaging the woman who is the victim of the violence. In some cultures, the men believe they have the right to be violent. How do you address this in minimizing the violence against women? Uh, the, the question relates to uh, addressing perpetrators of violence and in both the UK and in Australia there are new public awareness campaigns targeting young boys and their respect for, for women and uh, behaving respectfully and not using violence when they're frustrated or angry and so anger management type questions as well. But I think the, uh, the, the intention is to start these initiatives as young as possible. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question to Professor Lin. Uh, of sessions, yes. And we had groups of nurses come in, so we could only take, um, I, don't, I can't remember how many were, because um, we had three groups of students, three students, so we had nine total students. So we had three groups that would be working with each small group of nurses. And we would do this, the, the, tra the pre-test, the skills assessment, and the post-test. Uh, I, I also want to know in which form you take the classes, take the sessions, in which form? Uh, only lectures or other? So we were in small groups uh, around tables. So one group, one group, and one group. So we had, the, our students had made a poster uh, with the information, so they gave, um, they did the pretest. test so the, stu the, uh, the nurses wrote the pretest before they started, and then the nur our nursing students gave the, uh, the little lesson with a, with a poster and, and the IV equipment and demonstrated, and then each nurse had um, a, a new IV start kit and a new um, equipment to be able to, to attempt to do the cannulation. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, any other questions from the floor? I'm more than happy to run a 1,000 meters <laughs> through the hall. Just raise up your hands if you are any questions. 
Seems to me you guys are a bit hungry, right? <laughs> okay, make sure you got your lunch coupons, okay? And then our session is uh, closed here. And then uh, with Wu Ting and Ching Wang, it's not here. Last minute call. Okay, so thank you so much and thank you for joining our sessions here. Thank you. Okay, have a nice lunch and have a nice day here in Singapore with our uh, ICN Congress. Thank you.